Good morning. It says 9 o'clock on my phone, so uh, let's get today started. Welcome. I am uh, very pleased to be here. I open the final day. So my name is Christine Gorman. I work as a contractor consultant for a company called Cool de Market, and I have been working as a developer for more than 20 years now. And I'm going to talk about something that I've noticed, you know, over the years, there's one thing that seems to be true almost across the board. You know, every company that, that, I, you know, that I've been helping out or worked at or, you know, or that people talk about, people, you know, always seems to be working on the new platform. Yeah, am I right? There's always this new platform. You know, so yeah, here, new platform again? You know, <laughs> like I've, I've been doing this for more than 20 years now, and I'm starting to ask some questions here. I mean, there's always some poor souls in the background who are working on the legacy system, right? You know, they're like making features for users and stuff, but all the cool kids, you know, we're working on the new platform. And presumably, you know, this, the point of a platform, you know, it doesn't matter if it's an IT platform or an oil platform or whatever kind of platform, a platform, the whole purpose of it is it only has value insofar as it facilitates the delivery of the stuff that actually matters. You know, the platform itself has no value. So I'm starting to wonder, like, <laughs> when are we actually going to be, when are we going to get to focus on delivering the value that these platforms are meant to be, you know, giving us? You know, we are always working on the platforms. This is weird. So, I mean, like, we're not, are we just not very good at making platforms since that's all we seem to be doing? Or, or, or maybe, maybe we are. Maybe I'm looking at this from the wrong angle. You know, it's important to, you know, very often when you think you see a problem, you know, you're just not seeing the real purpose here. So we need to look at this from different angles and see why, why are we always building these platforms and who are they for and, and like what are we really achieving here? And very often when I bring up this, you know, I, I, you know, I work hands-on with code. So often, you know, when I bring up these kind of systemic issues, and I'm, I'm very annoying that way, I'm always bringing up these issues, um, I, I'm told that, yeah, but Christine, you just don't, you don't see the full picture. You're, you're just, you're just develop, you're a developer kind of on the floor. You don't see the big picture. That's why you don't understand. And, you know, and that is very important. I think it's really important to be aware of your blind spots, but, I, I just love this quote here. You know, those who draw landscapes place themselves below in the plane to contemplate the nature of the mountain. You know, if you want to really understand and see the mountain, you can't be on the mountain. You have to be on the ground to even see the mountain in the first place. And likewise, you know, in order to contemplate the plains, they place themselves upon high mountains. So, I mean, yes, it is true that as, you know, as a mere developer, I don't, I some <laughs> very often lack the big picture, but vice versa is also true. When you are standing up top and have the big picture, you lack, you know, the, uh, how imposing uh, the mountain you are on top possibly is. You know, so it's really, you know, this goes both ways. Having, you really need to listen. Every perspective is important here, and everyone has their blind spots. So, of all things, this is a quote from Machiavelli, which is a, uh, and again, I try to always expose myself to texts and, and works of, of people I, I, you know, have no expectation of agreeing with, because I think it's, it is really important to understand all the, all the points of view. And, uh, and again, here, I, you know, I read The Prince by Machia uh, Niccolo Machiavelli, and hey, I got a good quote out of it. Um, so, I recommend everyone really, you know, try to expose yourself to uncomfortable things that you you have no intention of agreeing with or, or whatever, you might be surprised. Anyway, but another thing I love about this image, you know, because here you have someone who's, you know, standing on top of the mountain to, you know, really get a good overview, um, but they're not getting a good overview, are they? Because there's a cloud cover here. <laughs> there are clouds in the way. Yeah? So even if you have, uh, you have the vantage point where you could, you know, see the big picture, in fact, you don't after all. And in a corporate setting, this you know, cloud layer is, uh, you know, often consists of you know, middle management bureaucracy and IT. You know, we are here. This is us. You know, we are not you know, the IT department or whatever. We are not the ones making strategic business decisions, nor are we the users 
of the software that we're making. We're this layer in between, uh, and we have our own agendas and our own you know, wishes and desires and ideas of what we want. So when we talk about you know, success, you know, who are we? <laughs> Who are, we, who are we talking about here? What is a success for one uh, group might not be a success for someone else. You know, again, who are we talking about here? Who are these platforms for in this case? I mean, are we trying to, you know, impress, is it shareholder value? Is that the thing? I mean, this is capitalism, you know, are we, is our goal to improve business profits? Is that what we're up to? You know, for the, for the business administration, again, they are on top of the mountain, they need this you know, they need to understand the vastness of what's going on. They need easy to understand, you know, graphs and KPIs and stuff so that they can make decisions across the board that will make sense. They don't have the capacity to go in and look at the details in every little bit. They need a good kind of overall perspective. So, I mean, that's important to them. Again, for the project managers, you know, their job, what they've been, you know, taught their field of expertise is you know, they need to deliver you know, a package on time and on budget. You know, they have a specification and that, you know, so that is their motivation. A success for them is, have we delivered what we said we would on time and on budget? Yes, success. When it comes to us, what do we want? You know, we want cool tech that looks good on our CV, right? We want to work on the latest, cool, amazing stuff uh, that we've learned about at conferences like this. You know, we've seen someone present something cool they've done, and we're like, yes, I'm going to run home, and I'm going to try that, and I want to do that. That's what we want to do. I mean, let's be honest. We just want, we want to work on cool tech. That's why we're in this. Um, and uh, yeah, finally, the users. What's the success for them? <laughs> Who cares? I mean. <laughs> <laughs> we only care about the users if we are forced to, you know, and, and that might sound harsh. It might sound like I'm just, oh, I'm just trying to provoke people, but like, this is sadly very true. And if you want proof, look at, you know, look at corporate software <laughs> where the users uh, are not the ones buying the software. Corporate software, I'm talking about any software that is bought by an organization, and then they tell all their employees, right, here, here's where you put in your hours that you've worked <laughs> this month, or, or, you know, I've just been working in healthcare, and oh my God, it is just horrible, the kind of user interfaces they have to deal with. It is appalling. Um, because, again, the users don't matter. They don't matter. They're not paying. They're not paying for the stuff. There's no business case here for, for really, for, for making the user experience great. I mean, here, this is, this is, I mean, it would be hilarious if it's not so sad. This is from the local newspaper in the middle of Norway, where they have um, followed in Denmark's example, actually. Denmark, they uh, introduced, is it Sundhetsplattformen, I believe, uh, which is an Epic uh, configuration thing. Epic is a big kind of uh, software platform thing from the US. Um, and so they, they failed in Sundhetsplattformen. There's been a complete disaster for usability, and they also have done this in Finland, in the Apotti, it's called there, and it's also a complete disaster. They spend lots of money, everyone hates it. So uh, Norway, we're like, yes, we need to try too. Uh, <laughs> well, actually, it's funny, because they said, you know, because we were like, but it didn't work in Denmark, it didn't work in Finland, maybe, you know. They're, no, 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 but we will learn from their mistakes. <laughs> like, that's not how you learn from their mistakes. What we should have learned was not to do. Anyway, but this is, this is doctors and nurses in Norway's third largest hospital. They are out on the streets with torches, <laughs> desperately protesting against the software system. Like, can we please, please don't force us to use this? I've never seen, I mean, this is like, you know, you cannot be more clear as a user, you know, <laughs> that you really want change. But, you know, do we listen? Nah, we don't care. We don't care. This doesn't matter. The users are not the buyers. From a business perspective, it doesn't make sense, it doesn't make financial sense to focus on a group of people that are not going to help you make money after all. You need to, if you are making software, you need to address the people making the purchasing decisions, which is why software made where, where we all are the ones getting the software, you know, their usability has to be better because otherwise we wouldn't use the stuff. But, you know, if you are selling stuff to a purchasing department, hey, well, that's who you need to impress. It's those people. You need to make them happy. And uh, I learned this early. I, I did um, all the computing courses I could while I was in the Norwegian equivalent of uh, high school. And one of my teachers there uh, <laughs> was this guy who had, I think he sold his company, and he was just working as a teacher for fun. So he was uh, doing physics and computing and stuff. And he told us stories about his, you know, his life when he'd been, he'd been working in his company. And, um, 
And there was uh, <laughs> this one software system they'd made. I, I forget what it does. Uh, but it, it, you know, they'd had mild success in Norway. Um, so they'd sold it to some companies, and, and they, you know, they were doing quite well. And they thought, well, OK, this is working in Norway. Let's try to expand. Let's go to, let's go to Denmark and Sweden, you know, Germany, England. And they tried to see if they could drum up some interest you know, uh, uh, abroad. And uh, yeah, they, you know, they weren't really that successful. No one seemed to be that interested. And, but then finally, after you know, a couple of years, they landed a massive contract in, I believe, Egypt. Uh, and I'll never forget, my teacher was like, isn't that interesting, guys? You know, why do you think, you know, why, you know, we thought it would be easier to sell in countries that are you know, more you know, culturally sim similar to us and whatever? You know, why, you know, why do you think we were successful you know, that far away from home? That's because we bribed them. <laughs> And that's what I remember from that computing course <laughs> here. But, but again, and, uh, he, it, it was not the users he was talking about. You know? he, they, they bribed the people who were making the purchasing decisions, because of course that's what matters. Um, and if we, <laughs> if we talk about, like, if you want to maximize the chances of, of really delivering uh, you know, uh, value for money and making the right decisions, you want to basically have a complete overlap. If you are making something with your own time and your own competency and your own money, and you are making things for yourself, then you have the highest chance of making the right decisions and getting what you want, right? A complete overlap of the user and the buyer and the, um, uh, and the implementer, right? Whereas what we see, uh, at least in corporate software, all too often, uh, is uh, is uh, this? You have the users over here, and then you have the purchasing department, and they, you know, it's a completely different. There's no overlap here at all. Yeah, and then you have the IT department. Of <laughs> there's no overlap there either. You know, this is this is far from ideal. You know, uh, and this Venn diagram. Uh, I have to thank my colleague Finn for suggesting that this actually isn't a Venn diagram. This is a Venn diagram. <laughs> so, <laughs> for non-Scandinavians here, Venn means friend and Venn means enemy. So this is more of an enemy diagram than a than a Venn diagram. Anyway, but all, <laughs> all too often when we then decide to make a platform. Um, and that's our focus. All too often, we end up just making a whole nother box here. You have, you know, the, the purchasing department buys a platform, whatever that might be, um, <laughs> and then you have a whole nother group of, of people who will be then using the, the APIs from the platform to deliver something to the users again. You know, and th this, is, this is very unfortunate that you have so many different groups and everyone has their own motivations and their own agendas. Um, yeah, yeah, so many agendas and that, that run completely counter to what anyone might hope would be a sane way of approaching uh, <laughs> software development. Like, for instance, you know, if you are an IT department, you are someone's like cost center. You get your funding from outside. You're not using your, you're not using, you're not creating software to help yourself make money. You are, you know, that's the only thing you do is you, de you deliver stuff to other people and you get a budget. You know, in that case, if you're ch in charge of that organization, should you use as much time and money as possible, or should you use as little time and money as possible? <laughs> you know, and uh, this should, of course, not be a real dilemma. We want everyone, obviously, to try to use as little time and money as possible, yeah, because that makes sense. But if, but of course, you know, if you think about this realistically, uh, th 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 you're going to press the as much money as possible every time because you have no financial incentives at all to reduce, uh, to, 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 you know, start delivering more for less. You know, and th this. I, I, you know, I've even heard managers say this out loud. You know, like if we start delivering more, they'll cut our budgets. This is a real thing. I mean, uh, and it's not just in computing. You know, using up your budget, making sure that you don't, you know, that you use everything up is super important. This is a real thing. In the military, my uh, uh, colleagues have told me that there's a Norwegian tradition, at least, of shitjulen, which is like shooting Christmas in or something, where basically you have to make sure that you're <laughs> using up, you're blowing up everything, you're using up all the ammo and all the explosives uh, by the end of the year, because otherwise you don't get as much next year. You know, so, and, uh, and there's a whole movement for managers now called Beyond Budgeting, you know, which is meant to address this, because this is a big problem, actually. I mean, <laughs> you know, people who get a fixed, um, fixed budgets like this, it causes horrible incentives where you actually try to use up everything rather than saving money. 
And I've heard so many times, you know, <laughs> you'll have these annual things where people are like, yes, we increased our budgets. We got, you know, X million more this year. This is fantastic. And I'm always thinking, well, you know, isn't that kind of sad? Shouldn't we, be celebrate, shouldn't we be celebrating getting less money because we're more effective? You know, I've never heard that. I've never heard anyone celebrate that. So, I mean, there's a, there's a problem here. Um, also, like, efficiency. Efficiency things, if you try, and I, I hear this, you know, as a developer, I'm always asking, like, can't I just talk to the users and just make what they want? You know, that would be, you know, very efficient. But of course, then you'll have a whole layer of, uh, of, uh, of people who are meant to manage that process who will potentially feel like they don't have a job. You know, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of this going on too, where people are worried about their job security. You know, that they, <laughs> they don't want to be, you know, they're worried that if you actually, you know, uh, save time and money, then, ah, you know, what will I do then? I can't just sit and drink coffee all day. Yeah. So, I mean, we need to address these. We need, we need to be aware of these things, at least. And, of course, you know, everyone knows that, you know, again, like, usability features, why on earth would I do that? You know, doing things right, that's going to cost too much. You know, so people will consciously go for crappy solutions because, yeah, um, that, that, that will, uh, the, yeah, doing it right will cost too much money. And again, for programmers, I mean, like, there, there can be a perfectly, the users can be perfectly happy, but, you know, we, we've been to a conference, we've learned, new, we, want, <laughs> we want to use the cool new technology. We don't want to work on this old, old tech stack. We don't want to, you know, we want to work on the new shiny stuff. Um, and I think it's kind of sad when it comes to, you know, making, like, business choices or whatever. There's this, there's this um, idea, I think, especially, maybe especially in the US, I'm not sure, but certainly, you know, Western culture seems to have this idea that, you know, to be successful, you kind of need to be a selfish asshole, you know, and there, there are plenty of examples of this, of course, you know, like Steve Jobs was a notorious, you know, like horrible person, uh, impossible to work with, but, you know, he was successful, and we have this idea that, you know, you have to kind of be this ruthless, you know, maximize your own uh, profits type of person to have success at all, but this, this just isn't true. I mean, like, you can also be successful by doing the right thing, you know, and, and, and whenever you say this, uh, you're often, you know, kind of accused of being, oh, isn't that, oh, that's just so naive and oh, so sweet and no, you have to be ruthless. Like, no, uh, because, you know, empathy is something the vast majority of us have. You know, we, this, this is a human trait. There are a few people who lack empathy and that's, you know, sad for them. You know, the, the, <laughs> the vast, vast majority of us, you know, if I make you smile, that's going to make me happy, you know? And being, you know, trying to actually do good in the world and being, uh, you know, delivering, you know, things that actually matter, not just to me, but to other people, that gives us success on a whole other level. So we can both get financial success and get the really good feeling of actually making a positive difference in the world. You know, so this isn't like, me being like naive and oh, a yeah, sweet little girl who thinks that we can be nice. No, this, this actually makes sense. <laughs> so we should we should do this. Uh, we should um, yeah. Anyway, try to try to think about like why are we doing this and how can I how can I actually you know make a difference not just for myself but you know in the in the bigger picture. So again, what is the right thing for us to do? Well, deliver software that makes the users' lives better because I mean that is the point of software. You know, we're not like. Hopefully, we're, you know, we're not, the society isn't run by like aliens or AI or anything like that. I mean, all software is made because there is some kind of human need out there that needs to be filled. I mean, that's why we're in this business in the first place. You know, we need to identify what, you know, who are the users that will benefit from what we are making. And then we need to focus on that. How do we make sure that the users are going to be, you know, uh, their lives are going to be improved by this. That's the whole point. And does a platform make users' lives better? No. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't. Again, like a platform, it, it like, platforms have no intrinsic value. The only purpose of a platform, no matter what kind of platform, a platform is only something that facilitates the delivery of the thing that actually matters. Users don't give a shit about the platform. I mean, they really don't give a shit about the platform. Let's think about this. I mean, here, there's a train platform. And uh, this looks, ni looks very nice. It's nice and airy. There's lots of, you know, it's not claustrophobic. It has, you know, anyway, looks fantastic. But with no passengers or no trains running through, this has zero value. Huh? We need, 
<laughs> we need, the, the point of this platform is to provide a decent you know, train service that, uh, you know, that gets you to where you want to be on time. That's, that's the point. And you don't have to have fancy platforms to deliver that. If you just um, <laughs> go, uh, go to where, uh, uh, where my, uh, my mother is from, actually, uh, I had this weird situation. I'm half American, so my American mother lives in Norway, and my Norwegian father lived in the US. So anyway, but like, so if you go to the US and look at train stations there, this is uh, my dad's train station in Virginia. <laughs> this is what they look like in the US. I don't know if anyone's taken the train in the US. It's hilarious. Well, look at that. There's no platform. There's no platform. And, uh, but you know, the trains run, and you have to, you have to like climb up the train, and it's just like, it's absolutely uh, hilarious. And like, uh, accessibility-wise, a complete disaster. But anyway, they have, Somehow, they have a functioning, a functioning train system. Um, but okay, let's see. You know, we're talking about like, you know, we need to focus on users' needs. What, which one would you choose? Well, I would choose the one my train left from for to start with. You know, again, like this is, you know, the, I'm not going to go to some fancy platform if my train goes from somewhere completely different. Yeah. Again, the point of the platform. <laughs> to you know, let me get on the train that takes me where I want to go. That's the point. Yeah. So that's the most. That's one of the most important things. Also, the closest one. I'm not going to go out of my way to visit like a fancy platform. You know, I'm going to. I'm going to go to the one that's closest to me. Yeah, every time. Yeah. Also, the cheapest one. And this goes for you know ticket prices, but also just. Um, you know, like uh, like in the U.S., they obviously they they maybe they have better things to do with their money. They they have some weapons to buy. I don't know. I mean, they have uh, they have other other priorities, and you know, and that's fair. I'm not saying the American priorities are correct here, but uh, but you know, the the point is that you know how much are you gonna, how much are you willing to invest in that platform? You know, you have to say, you have to have quite a bit of use to the platform before like a fancy one will ever kind of pay off. Again, the one with the shortest train ride. I mean, I'm not saying that the cheaper one is always the best one, but the point is that the, the only way that the more kind of fancy platform even makes sense to make is if it facilitates the delivery of these attributes that actually matter to me. You know, I, <laughs> I want an efficient way to get a train that gets me where I'm going. Yeah, that is the important thing to focus on. So again, the users, they don't give a shit about the platform. That is not the point. And the same goes for software, of course. Like, everywhere uh, lately, at least, where I've been working, everyone has Office 365, for instance, which is a, you know, a kind of a platform, I guess. Um, it gives you, um, you know, Outlook and Word, Excel, Teams, all of these applications. But of course, we still use Slack, right? <laughs> because Slack is better than Teams. We don't care that Slack isn't part of the platform. Who gives a shit? You know, we want a good user experience. You know, we don't care. We don't care about the platform. You know, this, this is just such a, you know, so many people are like, well, the users, they want everything on one platform. No, they don't. The users, I mean, yeah, if they can get maximum, you know, usability, sure. And it also is in the same platform as the rest. Yeah, great. But the most important thing is the usability, not the platform. Users don't give a shit about the platform. And API users, of course, are exactly the same. As a developer, let's say I am you know, making some application. Uh, it has to do with some kind of finances or whatever. And, uh, and, uh, and, and my organization has a platform, a unified SOAP platform, say, with, uh, you know, where I can send emails and surveys and billing and timesheets. I don't know, I'm just, you know, random example. Yeah? But then, I discovered that, hang on a second, you know, there are some actual, there's a really good uh, REST-based uh, uh, email service that I can use that is actually, you know, way more convenient, um, you know, and then maybe some GraphQL service that gives me much nicer surveys. Of course I'm going to use them. Of course I'm going to use them. You know, <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to go, oh, yes, but it's not on the platform. You know, like, no, of course, as a developer, just like as any end user, I'm going to choose the, the services and the APIs that are the easiest and most convenient to use. I don't care if it's on the platform. I mean, the point is, the point is ease of use. So um, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use those every time. You know, and, and again, like people keep telling me, yeah, but like, but the users don't want to have so many different applications. They don't want to have. They want things. Uh, they want a unified thing. Yep. Yeah, what? No. <laughs> This is obvious bullshit. So many people 
seem to somehow believe this, but like, come on, guys, yeah. And, and again, <laughs> one of those applications is Chrome. You know, and when you open that, you will have a whole uh, list of tabs with all sorts of different things in there. I mean, and try to imagine, you know, one application that has all the functionality available on those, uh, <laughs> on those applications. It's not possible. I mean, you, no matter how you uh, deliver this, you're going to have to split it into smaller bits. You know, and, and you, will just, you will never have everything on one platform anyway. You know, so we really need to, at least <laughs> from the outset, just, just know that you will never have this all-encompassing platform for everything. This is never going to happen. You know, so if we can at least start by acknowledging that, that would be a big help. You will be using other APIs and platforms and, and whatever. That, that is just a given. You will never have everything on one platform. And I think a much better way to kind of think of what, like, a platform, what, what that really is. You know, a platform is basically, it is a set of tools that an IT organization makes for itself. So I, I'm married to a mechanical engineer, so I'm always like, I, I think it's fascinating to see kind of the differences and, and similarities of how, how I work compared to uh, how my husband works. So he, is, um, he, he does prototyping a lot, so he's making products. He's like, I'm making digital products, and he's making, uh, uh, he makes, um, you know, things out of metal and, and whatever, and our, our workshop is just full of tools. You know, that's his platform. Here, here is a picture of, um, of uh, uh, one of the things he made recently. I, I can't remember what this is. I think it's part for some uh, truck or something. <laughs> but the point is, he has uh, here, uh, this is a really cool 3D, uh, no, three, three axis milling machine. Um, and, you know, for, for that to work, he then has to make tools, like fixtures to, you know, affix the things that he's making. So, that a, so he is all, and this is kind of, this is his platform. And he is always just like, we are writing scripts to help ourselves with, you know, making the builds more efficient. You know, he is making physical things, you know, to help him. So the majority of the stuff, you know, that he works with is actually tooling for himself. You know, he is working on his platform, you know, just like we are. And again, we, we of course, also need to have really good tools. Um, and, uh, you know, and we need to work on that. But the point is, at least in when people are making physical things, I think the people that are buying his services, they have a better grasp of, of what it is they're buying, I think, which makes them take more sensible decisions because they, you know, in this case, they are only paying for this part here. They don't pay for him to spend 10 years building up his platform. You know, of course not, because that would be stupid. Yeah? So, I mean, it, it makes sense for any organization uh, that is building anything at all. You know, you need to have an organized toolkit. You know, no one can work like this. You know, we need to invest significant amounts of time in building up our platform or our toolkit. You know, that is, that, you know, obviously, yeah, we need to have an organized set of tools that lets us work efficiently. But again, like, we don't pay for the electrician or joiner or plumber to organize her toolkit, yeah? You know, I don't have to invest in my plumber getting a pickup truck or something. You know, <laughs> that is something I take as a given that, yeah, well, yeah, I assume that you have the tools required. I'm not going to invest in, in the plumber, you know, spending years and years and years building up some kind of tool, and then finally, maybe, if I'm lucky, they're going to deliver some kind of plumbing system that might work. You know, because th that just would not make sense for me to invest in that. But somehow, and I think it's because the people buying our services, maybe they just aren't quite aware of how software works. You know, so, <laughs> so we're like getting away with this, you know? And no wonder, you know, we're not complaining, you know, because we get to work on platforms and make like, oh yes, I get to work on Kafka, and I get to do this, and this is, we're, we're, uh, having, a, we're having a ball. But honestly, we shouldn't be getting away with this. I mean, we should definitely be working on improving our toolkit, but it should be in conjunction with delivering something that actually matters to people. And we actually can do this too. And I think that one of the reasons that we are getting away with this is because, again, people, you know, software is a new field, and the people in charge of budgets and making decisions, they are used to this idea of, of these like physical you know, construction projects, like here, you know, back to trains again. I mean, this is a, a, a project in Germany at the moment, the Stuttgart, I think, they're making this new, uh, uh, new um, train station there. You know, and here is the plan of what they're going to be building, and they have obviously invested vast amount of time and money in trying to make this into reality. And of course, if you are building this, 
you know, you can't have a running train service while you're building this thing. I mean, at the moment, this is 30 years later and 10 billion <laughs> years later, it still looks like this. And obviously, you know, when you are building things in the physical world, you have to, you, you know, you just have to, yeah, drug yourself on hopium and just like hope that, you know, eventually you know, you're going to get something that you can use, right? Because you, you can't have, you can't deliver value as you're building. Yeah, and you have to, th you know, you have to think in a completely different way. But we don't have those constraints in software. You know, and I think that, you know, again, the, the decision makers aren't fully aware of just how different uh, and just exactly what we are making. I mean, we are making virtual things. We're writing text, basically. It's super easy for us to, we can just delete stuff and add stuff, and we can, we can change things as we go along. We can start off, you know, just making some kind of simple thing, and then we can expand on it over time. We don't have to, you know, build, you know, first this foundation and then a platform, and then finally, 10 years later, boom, here you go, and then if we find out it doesn't work. I mean, there's no need for us to operate like this. You know, yet we still are. I mean, here, this is, um, this is an old article by now, but here, like, uh, the NHS, you know, they try to, you know, put out to tender this, like, big health IT platform thing, and, you know, 10 billion pounds later, it was a, you know, complete fiasco, and this just came out. In the U.S., they've spent 50 billion dollars <laughs> trying to uh, customize some healthcare platform to suit the, the veterans' uh, medical needs. You know, it's just absolutely 50 billion, and, and they're not, you know, and they haven't actually delivered a functioning system. I think the public sector, of course, is, is the worst of these over overspends, um, but the private sector, too. I mean, here, Lidl, they recently, they tried to implement, like, an SAP uh, thing. <laughs> they spent, like, you know, half a billion euros in six, seven years, and I love this if you read the small text here. It says, after a successful introduction, the, the problems piled up and they had decided to pull the plug. I mean, like, what, what kind of success? What kind of definition of success is that? And I think the successful part was it cost half a billion. Someone made a half a billion out of this. You know, that's a big success after all. Um, and, um, you know, I think, like, our numeric understanding is a problem here, too, because, you know, here, this is a million versus a billion. Yeah, I mean, it looks, you know, it doesn't look that different. You know, even the words million, billion, sounds the same. Um, but, I mean, you know, th that's a million, and it, it, it's like a, that's a lot more, yeah? A million seconds is 11 days. A billion seconds is 31 and a half years, yeah? I mean, billions, it, it's the enormity of the amounts that we are spending on these IT platforms is crazy, yeah? And we're spending millions on user needs, and we're spending billions on platforms. Yeah, that's just not right. Um, and one thing that has struck me, and I haven't been able to really dig in the numbers because I don't have access to them, but it seems like the, the numbers here are interesting because these platform failures, it's like we're talking about like billions, 10 billion pounds, and, you know, or 50 billion for the US thing, billions of dollars or billions of euros. But in Norway, our failures cost only 10 billion knock. <laughs> so we are failing a lot cheaper in Norway uh, than everywhere else, right? Uh, and in Denmark, too, I guess. I mean, it's, it's, it's weird, but it's not actually weird if you think about it, because, you know, in a capitalist system, capitalism 101, you don't ask how much is this going to cost to make. You ask how much are they willing to pay, yeah? So, like, for, you know, Epic, when they are selling in their software system to, you know, one health region in the middle of Norway, you know, yeah, they, of course, they can't charge $50 billion, you know, but they can charge six billion kroner, which is what they have done, you know? So, uh, you know, and this is kind of indicative of how, you know, we all know that when you're writing software, I mean, sure, there, there are added costs if there are 50 million users or 5 million users. Yeah, there's a bit more cost and like you need more servers or whatever to handle the extra load, but the complexity and the domain modeling and the coding itself, it's not really that much more complicated, you know? So it's not, you know, it's just completely absurd to uh, expect to ha for this to be reasonable that, you know, making a, a computer system in the UK is somehow, you know, 50 times more expensive than making a system in Norway. I mean, uh, this is obviously, they're looking at the budgets and they are charging accordingly. Uh, <clears throat> so anyway, right, so my... <laughs> 
my message here, don't set out to build a platform. That is not your goal. You need a platform, of course you need a platform. And you know, by all means, have, have this idea that maybe one day, you know, we'll have, you know, we'll have a, an amazing platform, you know. Like Apple, for instance, when they made the first iPhone, they didn't focus on making, you know, the App Store and the Apple, you know, stuff. They focused, first and foremost, on making an amazing phone, you know. And then the platform has grown over time, you know. Let the platform grow. By all means, dream of platforms being all-encompassing and wonderful and solving every worldly need. And uh, nothing wrong with having big ambitions, but, you know, don't <laughs> let that happen as a byproduct of delivering what actually matters. I think Gall's Law is uh, fantastic in this respect. And Gall's Law states, a complex system that works is invariably found to have evolved from a simple system that worked. The inverse proposition also appears to be true. A complex system designed from scratch never works and cannot be made to work you have to start over beginning with a simple system. And I think this is, uh, yep, <laughs> this, this is true. You know, you, you have to start, start with something simple. And being software developers, making things in the you know, virtual space, we can really do this. We can start simple and we can evolve it over time. There's no reason for us to not really follow this completely. Because if you start, trying to, oh God, I will, we need to make a platform for everyone. You know, you go immediately, you go into people's front of Judea mode. Oh, this calls for immediate discussion, you know, and then nothing happens for years. You know, if anyone followed me on Twitter a few years ago, you'd have uh, heard me ranting excessively about this Norwegian healthcare project that thankfully has been canceled. Yes, uh, it was called Axon. Uh, uh, Axon, that's, that's how it's spelled in Norwegian. Um, so <laughs> they'd spent like 10 years and, um, you know, <laughs> in people's front of Judea mode, you know, planning, planning, and talking to everyone, and you know, making, uh, you know, uh, trying to figure out what, you know, what, what what was needed, you know, to solve basically, you know, healthcare software. Because I mean, yeah, that's that's just one thing that you can solve. Anyway, um, <laughs> so a lot, lots of people, me included, were very concerned. I mean, like this, these kinds of, you know, because uh, what they what they came up with at the end was we need to, we're going to spend ten years ish, uh, and about like. 10, 11 billion knock uh, developing a platform. Uh, and then we're going to spend an additional kind of maybe, you know, 10, 11 billion knock on, uh, impl on, on introducing it. And, and, and everyone was like, oh, bah, 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 bah. this kind of 10 year multi billion thing typically goes to shit. You know, we, we, this, is, this is not a good idea. So they, they hosted the people in charge. They had, a, they had a meeting actually where they were going to allay everyone's fears and say, no, 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 it's okay. We've thought about things. Uh, here is our plan. You know, so I, I, I went there and I, you know, again, I, I like exposing myself to views that I, you know, <laughs> that I won't necessarily, that I don't think I'll agree with, but I think it's important to understand where everyone's coming from. So I went and tried to keep an open mind, like, okay, what, what is their plan? What, you know, they've, they've got some people to think that, you know, 22 billion on this thing is a good investment. Let's he hear them out. They're, they must have a good elevator pitch. Uh, and here is, uh, I have, uh, uh, I, I took some pictures while I was there and I've recreated <laughs> some of the slides that was presented. And here was their, this was their proposal. So uh, 10 billion uh, or 22 billion in total would give us a foundation and, uh, and, a, and then a platform on top of that. And on top of that, it would be flowers. <laughs> what? Okay, what does that even mean? Uh, yeah, okay. And then uh, people had been uh, uh, complaining that, you know, well, why don't we split it up into smaller bits? And they're like, of course we're going to split it up into smaller bits. Here, uh, we're first we're going to do step one, and then step two, followed by step three, step four. Uh, like, I, I, I just, I, I'm, I'm endlessly fascinated because like you he keep hearing, you know, I, I showed you news articles of all these failures before, like $50 billion in the US and $10 billion in the UK and whatever. Um, how do these decisions get made in the first place? 
you know, why on earth do people decide, yes, we too shall try to implement Epic. It has failed everywhere, but we too shall do it. I just, I'm, I'm endlessly, fa how, how does this come across as a good idea? You know, how do you look at these vague pictures here and, and you're like, oh, shut up and take my money. Oh, this is amazing. I would love nothing more than a foundation with a platform and then flowers on top. You know, that's, oh, you know, I, 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 you know this is a perspective that I, I completely lack. You know, so if anyone can invite me into one of those meetings, I would love to see how that happens because, uh, yeah, anyway. Um, at least, you know, in, in the physical realm, I mean, here, the investment that they're making there, at least you have an idea of what you're getting. You have an idea of what you're getting. And you say, this looks amazing. And we can clearly see that our train system today is not working and blah, blah, blah. You, can, you have some kind of idea of where you're going. You know, with these software platforms, I think the people who are making the decisions to buy them and to fund them, they don't even know what they're getting. You know, this is, again, don't build a platform. And I need to stop talking, you know, I guess you guys are mostly developers. I, I need to find a stage where I can talk to the decision makers because, I mean, they are the ones who really need to understand this. I mean, the, you know, you really, <laughs> yeah, uh, this has to stop. You need to organize your work around what the users need because that's the point. The platform, we are the ones who want and need the platform, not the users. So, again, like, we do need a platform. That's the, yeah, we... It's not wrong for us to focus on the platform. We just need to do it in a sensible way. And the, the way that we most, the reason why these platforms so often fail is overgeneralization. You know, we get, the, you know, completely, you know, the wrong abstractions and the wrong organization of how things are. You know, because typically what the starting point uh, of, you know, oh, we need a new platform is you have Maybe you have a large corporation, they've maybe acquired other you know, companies along the way. You have this large portfolio with lots of different applications and everyone is implemented in, in its own way and, and it's a mess, right? And then the first and worst kind of overgeneralization that, uh, that people can do, and I'm sure that, you know, I don't know, I know I've uh, had this thought and, uh, and um, it seems to happen a lot as people, people start thinking, hang on a second. All the all of these applications, all they ever really do is they, you know, they they just they create data and then they, you can read the data back again and then you can update it and then you can delete it again. Let's make a CRUD platform, yes. Uh, uh, and you know, so many of these like no-code platforms, they fall into this this kind of trap. And uh, uh, and <laughs> and I'd like, I like I've 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 written stuff like this myself. I've made stuff like this myself. You know, so I, in a way, I shouldn't judge. You know, because it's easy to kind of think that you're being really smart and you're making this like generic thing. But uh, but of course, I mean, this is this is as dumb as looking at journalists and saying, huh, all of these people they're all just writing their own texts. All text, it's just words and sentences. Let's make a sentence platform, you know, where, where they can pick sentences from drop-down menus and it's going to be amazing. No. <laughs> I mean, there are some niche areas, you know, where kind of no-code solutions like this and having pre-made templates make sense. But these things are, you know, notoriously, you know, they can work for, you know, maybe 50% of the cases they work fantastically and then they completely fail to handle anything resembling a corner case. You know, this is, uh, yeah, every time. Uh, so don't do this. <laughs> and um, uh, another kind of more common um, way of failing, at least that, you know, us developers are involved in, um, is this kind of thinking. You know, you start, you know, you look at the, these, all these applications that you have and you say, well, you know what, every one of these has some kind of security needs. Um, they all have, like, front-end components and stuff. They all have, like, domain models and, and they all have this. You know, why don't we make a platform where we just have one kind of security thing and then we have one, you know, we have, we group all our, you know, persistence things are here and then we group all the messaging thing over here and, and yes, and then when you're making an application, then you, <laughs> then you can just, like, use the, the APIs for all of this and you'll be fine. And the problem with this kind of organization is that each of these blocks, security or you know, front-end modules or business rules domain model, you know, they don't provide value on their own. They don't, you know, you, you know, can the user test it? You know, you've updated some security feature. Can the user test it? No. 
I mean, security only gives value in a context of some kind of application, right? Uh, messaging stuff, it only provides value if there's someone messaging someone else. I mean, you, <laughs> you need the context of the user full application thing for it, to, uh, for it to have any value. You know, can the buyer evaluate whether it works? You know, this is also you know genius thing about the platform development this way. It means that you, the customer who's funding this, is physically it's impossible for them <laughs> to evaluate whether any of it works until it's all done. Yeah, by which time we've made billions, so we're happy. Uh, but this is uh, this is uh, not good uh, if you want to make sure that you're always delivering what the users actually need. And again, here, I love how so many of these uh, platform things are like, oh, yeah, we're agile. We have autonomous teams. And it's like, it doesn't matter. You, can, uh, you can't have uh, autonomy if what you are delivering has no intrinsic value on its own. You can have, you can have like 5,000 deployments a day on your, you know, security module or whatever, but uh, if, if no one can actually check that it works in context, that, that has no value at all. And what always happens in these situations when you start off grouping things like this, you know, you might start off when you finally can finish the platform and you're ready, when you start actually using it and the user's actual needs start appearing, <laughs> because you know the, what the users need is always really messy, and it never falls into the generalizations and the categories that you've made. There's always all of these like, oh no, oh shit, yeah, this is true for that case. Oh no, you know, and you end up with every one of these things bloating, 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 with more and more like, oh well, if A and B, but else C, or if not, oh you know, like millions of parameters that you need to supply, where your part only needs a couple, you know, but you need to supply everything because you know, it's this common thing that it needs to handle every case. And <laughs> for everything you add here, it becomes more and more scary to update it. Because you know, if I change something here, potentially I'm going to you know, mess things up for everyone else. And, and everything just slowly grinds to a halt. And, this, the, and I think the main problem with this, this way of organizing things is the need for communication across teams. Because that is the killer. If you want to be, if you want to be able to respond to your users' needs, you you want to minimize the amount of inter-team communication required to you know make that change. I mean, just like simple kind of graph theory here. I mean, if you have you know two nodes, there's one edge, so communication between two teams, that's fine. You know, then you know that that can happen reasonably efficiently. But if you add one more, boom, you have two more edges. You know, you add one more. Three more edges. One more. So this is not a linear increase. You know, the more teams that deliver something or that are necessary for for uh, providing value to the users, <laughs> the more you know, the more communication chaos there is. And the sad thing is that um, you know, this our starting point. You know, where you have lots of applications and everyone does their own thing. I mean, it, it's perfectly legitimate to want to tidy this up, by the way. Again, if you have, you know, a large organization and your development team, uh, maybe they aren't working on, like, B for years. You know, if they then come back to do something on B and then the tech stack there is completely incomprehensible and no one knows how, to wor how it works, you know, that's unfortunate. You know, so you should totally look for ways of standardizing. You know, th that's part of tidying up your toolkit. But you mustn't lose track of the fact that this way of organizing stuff, where every kind of every uh, user focused application has its own tech stack and its own team that, that focuses on that, I mean, there, there's zero communication needs. There is nothing more efficient than that. There's nothing more efficient than that. If someone comes in and says, I need you to change this, boom, you can change it. And you can deploy it. And you don't have to worry that you've messed anything up for anything else. There's nothing more efficient than, an or than organizing stuff like this. Um, and of course, if you, if you have to do this via you know, updating a platform, all of a sudden you're up to like 15 different communication paths at all that <laughs> you know, potentially will impact you. So again, like developing software should be like this. Can you add a field for handling this? Sure. You know, that, that's what we should aim for, right? If our focus is to deliver value to people, it should, be this, it should be as simple as possible to just do that. When you're in this platform context, you know, yeah, team A, they're like, yeah, we need an input field. And then you're like, oh, no, sorry, we're working on something for B right now. Fantastic. You know, and then, yeah, there's, oh, no, no, we, we can't actually do that because that will ruin things for, you know, Z over here. I'm like, oh. 
And then when you finally found a way, okay, right, we found a way to organize stuff so we haven't messed up for Z and <laughs> the security team has had time to implement our change. Um, and then we roll it out and then it doesn't work. And then it's like, oh, well, where is the error? Is it in, is it in my code? Is it in their code? Is it in their blah, blah? And then finally you're like, Oh, did you say uppercase? I thought you meant lowercase. You know, oh no, okay, all right. You know, and then you deploy again, uh, and then it still doesn't work. And they're like, oh. And then they're like, oh, did you see the QA environment? We rolled it out in the test environment. Oh, did, you know, and everyone knows here this is what takes time, and this is what stops up and halts progress. You know, all this incessant, you know, when you need to coordinate efforts and understanding across teams who have their own priorities this becomes a nightmare. And if you even manage to get something that then works for your application, then you have to you know, make sure that you haven't broken anything for anyone else. Everything grinds to a halt. And then you start working on the new platform. <laughs> because you can't work with this shit. Let's start a new one, right? Every time. Ah, yeah, it's like I've been doing this for 20 years now. I'm fed up. Um, again, we need to, this, I think, is just a much better metaphor for what we need to think about when we talk about platforms. Our platform should be just lots of simple opt-in tools that we can use. It's not this thing. It's just a collection of useful things um, that you can pick and choose according to your needs. So I mean, th if this is your starting point, you know, you can say that, okay, well, hang on. Here we see that these two actually are the same. Yeah. We've used the same mechanism two places, right? And here too, ah, both of these. They both use Kafka, say, for instance. And they both, they're both happy with that. Great, let's pull that out into our platform, our toolkit. Let's pull those things into our toolkit. And then the toolkit then becomes lots of small opt-in components. And no, no if else, you know, no big monstrosity complex things that everyone has to use. You can have you can have several types of the same thing, and you can just say, well, if you I um, mean, if your front end is view, here are some view components. If your front end is React, you know, here are some React things. That's fine. You know, you don't have to have everything. Doesn't have to be uh, this one thing. You can have small, useful, stable things that you can trust. And uh, yeah, again, like reuse. Here, this, these tools here are the kind of reusability we want to look for. You know, really small, dedicated, simple, solid things you can trust. You don't want this one tool that does everything in the whole world. I mean, this one you can buy, it costs $1,000. <laughs> uh, you know, this is the kind of thing that we are all too often making when we're making these platforms. We're like, oh, we want this big, flexible thing. And it's like, no, this is totally unusable. You know, you want to have small, simple, solid things that you can trust. And you can have lots of them, that's fine, you know? And you pick the one that you need for your job. And again, for the platform components here, it's really useful if the common things, if all the teams, your teams should be dedicated to user needs, and then the common things, Everyone should have access to them. Where possible, where that may, you know, where, where at all possible, that is a great benefit because that means that if I, as you know, in Team A, if I need to update, you know, something in a, in, a, in some kind of persistence library, whatever, or, or service, I can just go in and do that. I can do that when I need to. I don't have to sit and wait for you know some platform team to have time for me. You know, and then hopefully manage to convey my needs in a way that they implement it correctly, uh, I can actually just go and do what I need to have done. And by all means, then have code reviews and, and stuff. But if there's communal kind of ownership and access to the communal things, that, has, uh, that makes it more effective and more efficient, um, but also it increases, it, it causes alignment automatically. You know, everyone automatically gets familiar with how things can be done and you learn from each other. Um, so this is just much more efficient. And again, wherever you can to facilitate this, tr if your platform consists of you know, useful compile time libraries, makes this a lot simpler. You know, if you are you know, sharing common kind of libraries, then I can go in and I can update whatever I need. I can bump the version. I can let everyone know, say, hey, there's a new version of this. I've added this thing. Then I can deploy you know, the thing I'm working on without worrying about having destroyed anything for anyone else. So I can safely, you know, I can test my part. I can roll it out. Um, and then the other teams, 
they can take that in, they can update the version and on their side when they have time, and then they can test that their stuff still works, and then they can roll it out. And that way you have a safe way of rolling out stuff and updating it without having to have a situation where you know, you're worried about, oh no, but what if I change this? I might break everyone else's stuff, you know, because that, that is a real killer. If, if people are worried about that, that's going to stop your progress immensely. And if, you have, if you're depending on like, these common running services, you know, then you meet that kind of problem a lot more, and you have to think about all well, you know, version, you know, URLs and, and uh, all this kind of stuff. So, I mean, where you can, <laughs> having a kind of platform toolkit of, of common libraries is, um, is preferable. So, and again, here, you know, like uh, application A, they use, you know, a certain amount of tools, and B, they use, you know, different ones, and that's fine. You know, it's like, you know, when, when uh, mechanics are, are making stuff, they're, they're not like, oh, no, I didn't use all the tools. I mean, that's, like, <laughs> that's not an issue. You know, the point is you need a toolkit that has, uh, you know, useful things that you might need. You don't have to use them all, you know. Uh, um, and another thing, you might not even want to share code, just having good readme files. Having regular sessions where developers talk to each other and share what they've done and how they've done it. That is, can be just as good as having this, like, everyone's using the same system. No, I mean, people can, can use the same you know, way of thinking about stuff and solve things in similar ways without actually sharing the code. That is a perfectly reasonable thing to aim for as well. So again, what you want, you don't want, you don't want, you don't want this like big platform that you know everyone uh, is plugging into. You want every, t you know, teams dedicated to use cases, and then they take things out of the platform, and they then have responsibility for how they, you know, how they use the platform component. That's what you should aim for. And this is, uh, you know, so here you're getting the reuse and the, you know, simplification and, and the standardization that you need, but in a much more sensible way. So, um, or yeah, or a more flexible way. And this also means that you know, instead, of, instead of having a, you know, a platform that slowly grinds to a halt and then you start with a new platform because the other one obviously doesn't work anymore, you know, this way of doing stuff means that um, it's much easier if you are making a new part or you're updating uh, some application and you notice, you know what, this you know, messaging system isn't working for me. You know, it's easier for you. You can just do something completely different. You can add your own thing. And then once that is successful, then you can add that back to the platform. And then maybe over time, everyone else will say, you know what, yeah, that, that's better for me too. And then they will gradually start adopting what you did. Again, use, then reuse. You know, so this way of doing stuff means that, yeah, you're still always working on your platform because you, know, you, you, you need to work on you know, having a good toolkit. That is essential. You know, not against platforms as such, it's just how we do it. You know, we need to be working on having a good toolkit, but this way of working means we can do that while delivering value. And <clears throat> I have a few minutes left, so I have to just uh, say a few words um, about cloud. Because that is, uh, so many of us now, that is the new initiative, right? That's why we need a new platform, because we need to go to the cloud. And this might be a really good idea, but there are issues about this that I think need to be discussed more. Because <clears throat> the thought and the sales pitch for going to the cloud is that it is much more efficient that you have, you know, obviously your scaling needs are handled, um, and you don't have to, you know, spend lots of time and money and effort on your own data center. Right? That, that's, that's the point, right? Uh, that you're kind of delegating that to, you know, experts like, you know, Google and Amazon and, and uh, Microsoft. Um, but here, this is, <laughs> here's a really interesting article, The Cost of Cloud, a Trillion Dollar Paradox, where they've, they've looked at lots of, you know, large uh, systems. Um, or large companies, uh, Dropbox uh, is one of them uh, <coughs> that's profiled, uh, and how, how their cloud uh, solutions have worked. And here you can see blue lines, that is spending on on-prem solutions. It's like data center costs and stuff like that. You know, and, I, and then the orange, that is you know, what we're spending on cloud. And as you can see, we're not actually spending less on on-prem solutions. We're not spending less on data center. If anything, it's actually going up. Uh, but we are also spending lots on cloud. And for companies that have you know, large, stable workloads and already have you know, their own kind of infrastructure you know, uh, sorted out, like Dropbox is a <clears throat> one of the featured uh, companies, they have chosen to repatriate you know, their stuff off the cloud. They went cloud, and then they've said, you know what, we're just going to bring it back on-prem again. And they have seen and th this has been for lots of these companies repatriation results in a third to a half the cost 
of running the equivalent workloads uh, in the cloud. So they're they're spending, you know, they're spending like three times as much in the cloud. That I mean, if you have so I'm not saying don't go to the cloud, but I'm saying if you already <laughs> if you already have an ops department, you already have the servers, and you already are handling the loads that you need, you know, maybe you should be you know considering this anyway. And uh, very often I found that. <laughs> <laughs> I was discussing this on Twitter. Um, like, why do we why do we want to use cloud? And I think w w the main reason for us developers, we're talking about our incentives here. You know, we love cloud because then we don't have to submit tickets to the ops department to get anything done. We can just like we can just provision stuff ourselves. Yes, you know. But if this is the reason for going to the cloud, you might consider maybe finding ways of, of, of facilitating better you know uh, collaboration <laughs> between your developers and your ops department. You know that that might be a much more cost effective solution. So uh, again, I think cloud fantastic. Um, but think about this. You know, this is you know, <laughs> people are uh, saving two. Th you know, they're 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 reducing their costs by two thirds by repatriation. So that that should tell you something. So you know, again, and uh, finally, do the users care if you're running on the cloud? No, of course not. They don't care. And do the users care if your APIs are SOAP or REST? No, of course not. You know, do the users care if your front end is like JSP or React? No, they don't give a shit. You know, we need to start caring about what the users actually need and want. That's what we should be focusing on. You know, what is success? This ha and happy, enthusiastic users. That's what we should be aiming for. We should be exposing ourselves to the people that we are making solutions for and making sure that we are indeed improving their lives because that is the point of making software in the first place. Right? Thanks for listening. <laughs>